Hi, this is Glenn Kaiser with the Dolby Institute and welcome back to our Oscar Contenders podcast. I'm super happy to be back at Skywalker Sound at Skywalker Ranch with my old friend Gary Rydstrom this morning. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Um, we're here to talk about Ad Astra today and Gary is nominated in the best sound mixing category. Congratulations. Thank you. I think this is your 19th nomination? Yeah, I saw, I, I actually, uh, someone sent me a thing from a local paper where I grew up and it said, you know, Elmhurst boy wins 19th nomination, right? And they had a picture of Richard Hymns. <laughs> <laughs> that's my life. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. the hometown paper can't get it right every no, time. No, that's true. Yeah. But not only 19 nominations, but you've won seven of these little yeah. Oscars in the past. Right. Um, for films like Terminator 2 and Saving Private Ryan and Jurassic Park. So um, it's really it's really a pleasure to have you on the show and sit oh, down thanks. and talk with you. Yeah. About Ad Astra. Yeah. I'm really curious about this film. It's, I, I, I came to it with a very open heart and mind because I realized Good. very quickly that it's a mashup of two of my favorite films of all time. Well, so you're going to say Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse and, Now and 2001. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty good mashup. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So was that part of the conversations that you had? Tell me about the conversations that you had with uh, director James Gray, uh, who co-wrote the script. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at what point did you get involved with the film? Did you get involved before they shot or in post-production? or what? Tell us about how, how this came on to onto your plate well it, it, this came onto my plate mostly because of tom johnson who mixed with me and has done i mean i worked on the yards years ago with james um tom's done many of james gray's movies so uh, he knows him very well tom johnson who is also nominated yes, for the oscar also with nominated. you in this category yeah. right and um and we came on to, i actually came on to a little bit late uh, doug murray and bob heim who uh, bob heim in new york were the supervisors at first the whole schedule shifted mm. it took uh, a while to get the movie cut and finished so i kind of came on late there was actually a lot of good work that doug murray had done for the sound effects before i even came on so it was kind of like getting a, a good head start uh but you know james gray is james gray went to usc cinema where tom and i went we had that kind of bond so we kind of talk you know he's very good james at talking cinema <laughs> if you've ever interviewed or talked he's to james a, he's Gray. a very very smart guy and very, very knowledgeable smart. about his film very knowledgeable about his film very knowledgeable about other films yeah and what works yeah. for him right um so you're right i think he pulls the dna and movies that he loves although this is a still a fairly unique movie um the the apocalypse now design of it which he would be open about what that meant for us is that there's a journey to it so you go further and further it, away from home you're going up river right you're going up river so <laughs> right. we're going to neptune instead of and then we see another great actor tommy lee jones instead of marlon brando but exactly. it's so it has a journey to it so we go from earth and the world we know to a world that's completely not only unknown to us but isolated right so that has that structure to it and things get you know in some ways weirder yeah. and more internal as it goes, as does Apocalypse. Right, right. And I want to talk with you about how you use sound to kind of echo that sense of increasing isolation and, and, and weirdness. But uh, just to take a step back, um, we talk a lot, you know, we've t spoken on this podcast many times with various artists about uh, about subjective use of sound and POV and how that can be a very powerful tool for a filmmaker mm -hmm. to put the the audience in the head of the character yeah. to give them the experience of what the character is. And I feel like this is really a great, you know, I think you could teach a masterclass using Ad Astra to illustrate that concept because, well, first of all, Brad Pitt, I think, is in he's in every scene of the film. It's really, yeah, you're it's following his, that character. He's he's the movie. He's the, he's the backbone. Right. So tell me a little bit about, like, E even in the use of the the flashbacks, which are really interesting to me, they some of the flashbacks tend to be just a shot, mm -hmm. very very. Then there's sort of like a presence in the film that that James keeps coming back to. Right. I I may be wrong about this, but I feel like there's you guys almost never used sound with the flashbacks. Except for that one really devastating moment when she throws her keys down as she's leaving. <laughs> the, yeah, the key. I mean, actually, you know, I thought of that as kind of the uh, the sound of them breaking up. Right. You know, so then she, it's a very distinctive moment. She looks at him for a, a beat or two before walking out the door and just puts the keys down. And they're pretty loud. Yeah. So we used the sound of that, those keys, literally, again, in a flashback. And he recalled that moment. Um, and then I did, I mean, I, on a technical weird thing, I, I found this way of stretching, turning sounds 
into sort of weirder sounds or ambiences. So I did a lot with voices. Tommy Lee Jones's voice I turned into ambiences and tried to get subliminal. It's a father-son story. Sure. The keys, um, there was a... Um, uh, you know, they got turned into all sorts of things, including the uh, if you the few times you hear the guns in the uh, in when I mean, they shoot the, um, the the baboons. There's these guns that they use, right? And is that the same gun that they try to use on him when he takes over the uh, yes. the ship that's going? So the to, gun right? is actually the, one element of the gun is made from that key sound because you could just kind of phase it and stretch it and turn it into a, la- a laser kind of gun sound. So oh, that's fascinating. The whole movie is full of taking key sounds. And then manipulating them and trying to use them somewhere else in the movie in a way that no one would ever, no one's ever going. It's the keys making the gun, but it's it's uh, it truly subliminal. But the movie seemed to hold that right. idea because it's an incredibly interior movie about getting inside Brad Pitt's brain. Right, right. I want to ask you just even from the very beginning, you introduced that under the 20th Century Fox logo, which. Sadly, may be one of the last times we ever see that logo. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me about that tone that you introduce, because you don't use the Fox fanfare. Right. You, you introduce a tone that then gets, and that also is an element that recurs. That's Tommy Lee Jones. So this is Tom Johnson's idea that he, he loved the idea of, of using kind of doing a kind of music concrete, uh, turning, not just stretching Tommy Lee Jones' voice into ambiences, which you do later, but in the beginning, it's looped. So huh. they're actually, I love you, my son. I love you, my son. Lines from the movie that are looped. It's sometimes you kind of hear them, sometimes you don't. The very beginning is Tommy Lee Jones, you know, doing a line. And then Tom himself did it. I was the sound designer. But Tom, <laughs> but we set Tom, up Tom. But Tom, the dialogue mixer, was Tom the sound the designer in that Because it's dialogue and it was his idea. And he, he had very distinctive ideas about how to, you know, to do these loops to get inside you, you think about it, I mean, the, we knew that the problem, not problem, we knew the challenge of the movie was we had a main character and it's about him, he's in every scene, but he doesn't say much. And he's kind of emotionally inert. Yeah, and I mean, that's it. He's trying to connect with people and he's having a hard time. So we had to find clever ways to feel what he feels and right. try to get inside what, what his thinking is. And it really is at heart, if Apocalypse Now is, is, a, is a template, but it really is a father Right. Son story about you know Brad Pitt's character, you know what parts of me are from my father, what good parts, what bad parts, and that kind of elemental um, bipolar. You know, right. there's good and bad that and, I get from my father. And how do I deal with the bad? Parts? Uh, yeah, how do we do? You know, and and that's that's the story. So the tape loop idea that Tom came up with it recurs throughout the throughout the film in sometimes more overt ways than others. That's fascinating. Yeah. I did not pick up, I mean, I recognize it as a recurring element, but I had no idea that that was Tommy Lee Jones' voice. Right, And it, but the movie sustains it because James shot the movie in a very interior way. So the opening of the movie, you have you know, Brad Pitt in his, in his space helmet, and I love how he shot the, um, the opening scene, which is quite a wonderful action scene on its own. But You're talking about the first pulse and then Brad right, Pitt the falling tower, off the tower, right? And which is a, a, a wonderful scene on its own as an action scene, but it's it's shot. We first really meet Brad Pitt. There's a lot of shots from inside his helmet, people talking to him. We don't understand what they're saying. Right. So it's pretty um, baked into the movie that this is a movie about a character who's having a hard time connecting with people on Earth trying to understand his father going far, far from Earth and realizing that what he needs is connection back on Earth. Right, right. Which really gets back, well, it's, we haven't talked about this yet, but I, it's, it, I think you know one of the things that was the most shocking to me about the film is you get to the end and you understand that one of the major themes is we really are alone. There is no, yeah. that, that, that's, the great sort of, that's the great sort of twist that I think James introduced on the, right. on, the, on the search for extraterrestrial life kind of thing is this notion of like, yeah. oh, we really, I think Brad Pitt says it, we're on our own, right? Well, Tommy Lee Jones' character is, kind of goes crazy, but he goes crazy in the, in the great tradition of making a bad guy's motivation understandable. That's right. He goes crazy because he's looking for something that we can all understand, looking for that meaning, looking right. for connection. Um, Brad Pitt's character learns that the connection is more important back home. Tommy Lee Jones is just going to go further and further out to keep searching for it no matter yes. what. Yes, um, But yeah, it's a... It's an existential. I mean, not too many movies um, would. You know, it, it 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 does subvert the 
um, even 2001, we, in the end of 2001, we realized, oh, there's others out there. I mean, this is... You know it from the very beginning with the yeah, model. Yeah, the yes, model. Right, so exactly. yeah. this one is, no, we're really alone. Yeah. And I always joked that it's a, a terrible movie for NASA recruitment because it, <laughs> it makes you realize that, okay, that's, it's fun to explore and amazing to explore and there are things to learn, but we belong on Earth, yeah. you know? So I think... Um, that's, but but we understand the motivation of Tommy Lee Jones's character to search for that right. meaning out there. I I really enjoy those kind of films where, as you say, like you get to the a certain point where when you when you can understand why the antagonist is acting in the right. way that he is, and so nobody is really a right. bad you know a bad guy. It's right. And the father son stories are often about the father being disconnected from the son. The reason this father is disconnected is because astronauts tend to go far away sure. from home and for a long stretch. It's, like mixers, um, <laughs> uh, uh, go to LA for weeks at a time, and um, uh, so it, you, so it everything kind of comes together, you know. It, um, but what would, you know, all these themes and about connection, and everything else are. James is a, is a great enough filmmaker that he he puts that into the visuals of the film, and then designs the film to take advantage of what the sound can do for it. So it's, that's, that's why I came on. That's why uh, Tom and I were excited about doing it because we knew he was the kind of director that would, um, as we like to say here at Skywalker, design the movie for sound. Right. Right. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about the, the pulse, the, uh -huh. which we, Gamma. Which, yeah. And <clears throat> so we, we, I think we, we encounter the pulse, I don't know, three or four different times mm -hmm. in the film in various locations. First of all, right in that opening sequence when Brad Pitt gets knocked off the antenna, but the sound is really fascinating. Can you kind of walk us through the process of creating the experience of the pulse? Well, the, the, so it's gamma, I, you know, I, don't, I think the, the sound that it makes itself is feedback, just kind of overload. Um, the movie's got various moments where the, you want to feel like this is the kind of sound that could not possibly be picked up by microphones, right? Mm -hmm. So what's because, fast, it's, because it's too powerful. It's too powerful. It's too it's too loud, and and um, uh, that's an interesting thing to try to get across. So um, the the gamma, the light, the sort of the the visual effect is supported by feedback tones, you know, tones that. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating to me, what I thought was was most effective when it really overloads when you overload a microphone it'll cut off right so you and if these... you're human and you listen to something that's if you're standing next to a saturn 5 rocket take off, you'll probably shut down right. so all the gamma moments have this kind of build up where everything you know the wherever we're in the tower the spaceship overloads the feedback sound gets loud and then it cuts to nothing you get this vacuum so and then then life returns so uh it's that absence of sound that makes it um, it, it goes back to Ben Burt and I had a good time on Attack of the Clones. The, with the, which, with the, uh, with yeah. the, those, the yeah. charges in yeah, space. Charges. Yeah, charges. How do we make this really big? And then right. Ben came up with the idea, we'll just put no sound and then have kind of a, a, delay. a vacuum and then yeah. a wah, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I was going back to my Star Wars uh, roots for that idea. But it's the absence of sound that makes you think, oh, this is a powerful sound. Right, right. Let's talk about the uh, the the lunar rover chase sequence i feel like you guys established some rules of the physics of this universe mm -hmm. from a sound perspective yeah. um and I, I feel like one of the rules is like we're hearing we're hearing external sounds but maybe only through vibrations in the suits or can yeah. you talk about that that's exactly it. I, I, mean, I took inspiration and gravity did a beautiful job of that's this. right and you know skip left say and um they you know sort of it's a it's a dilemma in sound for space movies, because there's no if there's no atmosphere, and the moon has zero atmosphere. Unless you just take the Star Wars approach and put the sounds in. Yeah, if we take the well, yeah, <laughs> um, and which works too. And um, but that's not the kind of movie you're making. Yeah, but what what a fun that was. So it was a a great um, opportunity again. So yeah, we we took the, it was a point of view again, talking about the movie being as if you are experienced this journey yourself or through the eyes and ears of Brad Pitt's character. So the lunar chase is essentially heard through the helmet microphones of Brad Pitt. So when someone, you know, bad guys shoot their, their guns off in the distance, we have nothing there. The only thing you hear is the, the impact on your, on your rover. If the other rover is getting hit, we hear nothing. It's because it's too far away. So we're only hearing things that are resonating. And so I got to 
use, I've joked about this, but I used all the bad sounds from my library, everything distorted that fed back and did <laughs> just weird, you know, all the, all the garbage that you call out of the other tracks. I went, well, here's a chance. It's yeah, like yeah. making goulash, I guess. Yeah, you yeah, know? So you yeah. take the, here's all the crap I've edited yeah. out for the past 20 years. But again, it, the, the distortion, distortion became our friend in that scene. Cause when things passed by, it was literally overloading microphones with, with something or just overloading a digital processor. So everything just kind of went. Just flanges just and gets <laughs> weird. Yeah. Um, and then the absence of sound where you see something visual and as an audience member in the movie, you expect to hear something. When sure. you don't, that's actually very impactful. Right. So when the first guns get fired, you don't hear anything and go, huh. And the next thing you hear is the impact on the rover we're on. And it's as if you were trying to make the sound make you feel like you're there. Yeah, it did. It was remarkably effective. Lunar rover is set for departure to the far side launch complex. Look at this. The big blue marble. Rover 7, confirming settings. Bearing 2 9 0. Alpha, we have what looks like unidentified rovers approaching our position. Possible pirate activity. Alpha, we need backup ASAP. We're being ambushed. LRV-2 down. Rory, have a puncture. Roy, you all right? I'm okay. Alpha, repeat. We need... Lieutenant. Oh, Lord. Got another car. We are not. Go, 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 go. Take the white flag. Take the white flag. We are not clear. I repeat, we are not clear. We have multiple enemy craft in pursuit. You've used that technique and it's, it's interesting. Uh, I remember when you mixed Punch Drunk Love for Paul Thomas Anderson, there's a lot the of scene, distortion in that movie there's too. The, well, there's the scene where, uh, where, where Barry, is it Barry Egan? Is Barry the Egan beats yeah. up the bathroom. That he gets one? in the bathroom mm -hmm. and he, he, he has his little meltdown and he destroys the, you know, right. destroys the bathroom, which was very carefully covered by Foley yes. and sound effects. And it was yeah. just this, you know, pristine, no, that that it's related, and Paul Thomas Anderson. Anyway, again, that's one where I I went the other direction. We made the traditional, uh, you know, he it, he's in the bathroom at a Chinese restaurant, I believe it is, and he's really <laughs> mad at himself. Right, so it's, 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 and he's incredibly violent, and it's shown through the whole movie how violent he is. Um, so yeah, and uh, we did it all like you would do traditionally, and he Paul Thomas Anderson had us use the mics from the day from the production, the wireless, the, the wireless, wireless mic and, Adam and the stuff that yeah. were moving with Adam Sandler. Sure. Same thing. There's a car crash in the beginning of Punch Drunk Love where right. a car just crashes and a harmonium shows up. Right. Same thing. We use the production, just overloaded. <laughs> just, again, we had all our pristine Hollywood <laughs> tracks and we just throw them out and put in the production. Um, but he was going for the same thing, which was. A point of view. That's another point of view movie. You're sort of seeing the world through the point of view of Barry Egan, who is a uh, inter externally quiet, internally violent person. Right. Right. So distortion is a key for people key. just starting in the sound business. <laughs> do not ignore the power of distortion. I think that's the. Uh, I think that's probably the the sound bite for this episode. That's the takeaway. Yeah, but I love that it's it's really you guys use it to such great effect. Well, even the opposite distortion, you know, the, just the silence. That that the, to me the most powerful moment in the lunar chase sequence is when Brad gets T boned and spins off mm. into the cr and and falls a long. This is a big crater. Right. Oh, yeah. Falls a long time in the crater and right. pretty much total silence right. until the impact. Right. And uh, contrast is also a friend and for dramatic purposes. So before he gets launched into the crater, it's the loudest part of the scene. He's T-boned and that's the, the most distorted. And, and again, I'm using feedback too. So it's not just crunchy distortion, but I like a microphone into microphone or a speaker into microphone. Whoa, that terrible stuff. And that's part of the spinning too. And then it goes to 
no sound effects for the wide shot of spinning over the the crater and then landing. Yeah. Um, so contrast. Uh, you know, it, this movie is full of moments. There's a launch, a rocket launch from Mars, or actually a rocket launch from Moon. The Moon is even more interesting because since there's no atmosphere, any exterior cut of the launch is completely quiet, mm -hmm. and the exterior is very loud. Right. Contrast. Right. We yeah. love contrast. Rules of the world. Mm -hmm. Did you know that this was going to be a Dolby Atmos release? Uh, it was decided late, but we took advantage of it. Yeah. How does that affect how you're, from a sound design perspective, what do you uh, do? You do you approach a film differently if you know you're going to be able to mix an Atmos? Well, you you, you know the you you take advantage of. You know, we're always trying to take advantage of the 360. You know, Atmos gives us a couple of things that are wonderful. One is a full range surround field around the audience, so things like rocket launches and you know if, if we're close on a launch and the and the explosion of the launch goes over the audience it'll sound as full behind us as it does up front and the tops i mean this is a great movie for for ceiling speakers right um to uh, just get a sense of even those dialogue loops you know that something about the ceiling speakers feel internal sometimes mm -hmm. uh, there's some movies i wish i could go back maybe someday i will and do an at most like strange days <laughs> like what would just, you do with strange days I would if you take, were back? well it's a point of view movie a literal point of view movie where you're just, you know you're you're experiencing someone else's point of view the, the top becomes very important um and it uh it's it's kind of the I think of it as it potentially kind of the brain speaker. You know, you can kind of get interior up there. So we used it to effect. It, it, you know, Atmos um, was wonderful for this movie. It doesn't change what the sounds we put in the movie, but sure. it changes where we put them and, and how effective they can be. Yeah, Mars sounds really interesting to me in the in the movie, and from the moment that you kind of get to the to the base. To the to the um, to the American base in Mars, I felt like you guys were doing something really distinctive mm. in terms of the treatment of the sounds and the, the way the space felt. It was very it was very disconcerting, and that kind of matched, I would say, Brad Pitt's sort of <laughs> internal state at that point. Mars is really when things I think start to go really sideways for him. Well, it's, it's kind of like the Dulong Bridge sequence in Apocalypse, where you kind of go to you're getting a little crazier. Right. Um, so Mars is a little bit crazier for the. For the space sounds, for the rocket or sort of space sounds in Mars, we, then we did the old sound editor trick of using animals and kind of organic sounds to make them just, you know, the so creeks are really a whale and, and uh, you know, rocket launches have lions in them. Things that are just a little odd. Yeah. Um, and we did, I did, you know, at least some research into what the atmosphere in Mars is different than ours, but things sound different. What I understood was that on the exteriors anyway, you hear more low end and less high end. So it has... A bit of an underwater feel to it, um, so that was interesting to play with. Yeah, Mars was a step on the apocalypse now journey into the weird. Right, right, right. Tell me about that sort of anabolic chamber where he's doing the uh, <laughs> the where he actually records the messages that are sent out. From a production design standpoint, that gave you a lot of fun funness <laughs> to play with and on sound, right? Because well, and you know just the lack of sound. You know, then it's the key is how his voice is recorded right. and you know the the production sound and how close it is and how dry because what you don't want to hear is any reverb. And I think Tom I think the most important thing there is you know, they sucked out as much reverb as they could from the from the from the dialogue and you, psychologically it helps too because it feels like you're this you're just, close to right. the character yeah. um you know anechoic chambers don't make any you know just there's no there's no there there I, there's a little tone that i i put in i don't know what it is you know I, I remember in film school i had a lighting camera and lighting class and they said how would you light a dark closet so we had to think about how do you light darkness and sometimes you have to in sound you have to think how do we create quiet so it's funny how the complete absence of sound sometimes doesn't work. I don't remember what I did, but there's a tone that just sort of says that we're static and quiet and there's no reflection, there's no movement. Right. But the important thing is, is the character's voice feeling like there's no bounce. As you say, that, puts, that, that gives you the sensation that you're inches away from him in this very... And it works emotionally because it's a very intimate scene. He's talking to his father. Um, it works for the sake of... I mean, again, it comes to a filmmaker's choice. I, I don't know what if James was thinking so much about sound. I assume he did when he decided, I want to shoot this in an anechoic chamber, you know? And it, it fits thematically. The movie is about his isolation. Um, he's trying to connect with a father who's very distant. So 
both visually and orally, that's a good choice. That's, that was the kind of filmmakers we like working with. That's right. Yeah. Gives you something fun to work with. Yeah. Any other favorite scenes of yours from the film from a, from a sound design mixing standpoint? Uh, there's a the baboon attack is fun. <laughs> is it? Yeah. But in the baboon, you know, uh, Doug Murray, who did precede us, he, he did all the, uh, has done all the Planet of the Apes movies. So thanks, Doug. Those you are got some, some good baboon stuff. You got some good baboon stuff. And I, I am told they're not really baboons. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm sure the, the primate was uh, something different, but I think of them as baboons. But what was fun about that is um, uh, you know, there's a haunted house quality to preceding the baboon attack. So as they slowly move their way through the, through the spaceship, what we did there was put in these sounds that could be movement of the ship, could be creaks, right. but there are a lot of them, and you start to think, is there something alive here? So it helps when the shock of a living b- b- baboon comes at you that you had a little subliminal subconscious right. setup that something bad was going to happen. Well, which, because when the, when the baboon face comes up, you know, yeah. that's probably the last thing I was expecting yes. to see at that point. Yeah. And it could be, it's one of those shocks that could be like, what? But so I thought our, part of our job was to set up the audience go, okay, you know how it is sometimes in with shocks in movies, you want to, they're more shocking if you start to wonder what's coming. You right. start to think that something's going to come. Right. So, right. Movies full of opportunities like that that are well developed for uh, for us to take fun, take yeah. advantage of. Yeah, one of the things that that uh, I've noticed about your work is that you're that you're really great at that I enjoyed in this is is your use of of contrast. And so before you know before and after a moment like that, you'll get really quiet. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's I mean that's a a lesson I've learned from. Uh, people like Alan Splett, who was really... Alan Splett used to do, for sound geeks out there, Alan Splett did this trick with scenes that would get loud, something would kind of explode or, or fall apart or some loud moment. Back in those days, cutting on Mag, and he would cut, take the, in, you know, the, the sound leading up to this big sound, and he would cut off a frame or two of the outgoing sound. So you get this, you can't really hear it, but a little mini gap. Mm-hmm. So yeah, sound sound requires context, and context often requires carving a hole for it. Right. Yeah, and distortion. <laughs> Hole, uh, yeah, carving holes and distortion. Yeah, that's the that's the rule. That's great. Well, Gary, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today no, to talk with us about Ad yeah. Astra. It's really, from a sound perspective, I think it's a it's, it's a really remarkable achievement. Yeah, thank you. No, we're 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 proud of the movie. So. I'm glad people noticed. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. This is Glenn Kaiser. We're signing off from Skywalker Ranch. Thanks for tuning in.